developmental disturbances of tongue as we know tongue is the single most powerful muscular organ situated inside the oral cavity uh, it helps in deglutition mastication speech so uh, the we should know the developmental disturbances of tongue so okay so we should not mistake them with the normal variants as such so uh, if you see the embryologic development of tongue tongue is basically divided into two parts okay the anterior two thirds of the tongue and the posterior two posterior one third of the tongue we know tongue uh, during embryologic development it's uh, basically derived from the four branchial arches okay first second third fourth branchial arch okay the, the tip of the tongue it's formed by the first branchial arch Uh, the second branchial arch mesoderm just it um, uh, it grows below the first uh, arch mesoderm okay it doesn't contribute actually uh, and the third and fourth arch mesoderm uh, fourth branchial arch they give rise to the posterior one third of the tongue so uh, initially what happens is two lateral lingual swellings emerge on the lateral sides of the tongue these two lateral lingual swellings fuse with a central median swelling that is the tuberculum impar so these three Fuse to form the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Okay, uh, and uh, the posterior one third of the tongue. If we see, it is basically derived from the cranial part of the hypobranchial eminence. That is nothing but the third branchial arch, and the posterior most part of the tongue is derived from the fourth branchial arch. Okay, so uh, anterior two thirds is derived from the two lateral lingual swellings, and the fusion with the Uh, median tuberculum impa so that's the embryologic development if we see the division between the posterior uh, one third and the anterior two third is just marked by the presence of foramen cecum in between the two parts okay the foramen cecum it basically it's a remnant of the thyroglossal tract we know the primitive thyroid gland it descends from the base of the tongue to its position near the hyoid bone so during embryology development both the tongue and thyroid gland develop at the same time and there is a connection between the thyroid gland and the base of the tongue that is nothing but the thyroglossal tract the remnant of this thyroglossal tract is the foramen cecum which is seen at the division of the posterior uh, one third and the anterior two thirds of tongue so this was about the embryologic development of tongue so we'll see at what level the disturbances arise suppose there is non fusion of the two lateral lingual swellings we see a developmental disturbance suppose the thyroglossal tract remnant is present then we see a developmental disturbance so we'll see what are the developmental disturbances which we'll see today so we'll see the microglossia macroglossia the ankyloglossia cleft tongue fissured tongue median rhomboid glossitis benign migratory glossitis lingual thyroid lingual varices and the hairy tongue okay so what is uh, microglossia as the name itself indicates micro is nothing but small glossia is tongue so microglossia indicates small size tongue okay this is another condition called aglossia aglossia is absence of tongue which is extremely rare condition okay there is no such uh, condition called aglossia actually aglossia or absence of tongue in oral cavity it's also a form of microglossia okay microglossia with extreme glossoptosis uh, that gives a picture of a aglossia so microglossia it's basically seen in cases of uh, syndromes it's seen in associated uh, with a uh, few of the syndromes and uh, the the tongue present in oral cavity is of very very small size it's also known as a rudimentary tongue and uh, patients uh, with such a small size tongue will have obvious difficulties in speech obvious difficulties in eating obvious difficulties in the swallowing okay so that's about the microglossia and uh, microglossia is of two types that is the true microglossia and a relative microglossia what is a true microglossia true microglossia is nothing but the size of tongue is relatively small okay when uh, and if you compare the tongue to other morphological uh, parts in oral cavity if you compare the tongue to the jaws and uh, you correlate the size of jaws with the size of tongue sometimes what happens is the jaw size may be extremely large and it appears that the tongue is uh, smaller in size that is nothing but the relative microglossia uh, so because uh, microglossia or small tongue is associated with speech defects 
and um, the tongue it's also responsible for uh, mean, maintaining the eruption of uh, level of teeth to maintain the uh, muscular stimulus if it is present it allows for the normal alveolar development of jaws so in absence of uh, normal sized tongue when the tongue size is small the jaw de uh, jaw development is also affected to certain extent so dentoskeletal malocclusions arise so orthognathic corrections and speech and language improvement therapy should have to be given to the children affected with this microglossia okay now we have seen microglossia what is macroglossia as the name itself indicates macro is nothing but large so it's an enlarged tongue also known as prolapses of tongue or enlarged tongue it is a condition where the patients have enlarged tongue again it may be a congenital one or an acquired one it's most commonly associated with beckwith wideman syndrome down syndrome both of these uh, syndromes they present with the uh, characteristically enlarged tongue in the oral cavity and uh, congenital macroglossia uh, it is due to extreme over development of uh, musculature and you know macroglossia again it is of two types true macroglossia or a pseudo macroglossia true macroglossia it is a condition where the size of the tongue is uh, enlarged okay uh, it may be due to any inflammatory condition uh, it may be due to any uh, developmental inherited condition like the cretinism hypothyroidism Uh, it may be associated with backward white band syndrome down syndrome it may be associated with any anomaly or a neoplasm of the tongue like the hemangioma the lymphangioma of tongue so any underlying neoplasm moving may lead to the enlarged tongue so that's a uh, case of true macroglossia so what is the case of pseudo macroglossia pseudo macroglossia is nothing but suppose uh, the individual is having enlarged tongue and suppose he has a habit of keeping tongue low in oral cavity or high in oral cavity that leads to over development of musculature leading to the enlarged tongue so that's a case of pseudo macroglossia okay so the causes of acquired macroglossia are uh, as i told tumors in the tongue or uh, acromegaly uh, generalized uh, Uh, body growth is also increased in acromegaly and the myxedema amyloidosis deposition of some foreign material uh, some proteinaceous substance in the tongue owing to enlargement of tongue or the angioedema it's an allergic condition leading to inflammation of the oral cavity and uh, tongue is also enlarged in such a case so any cause may lead to true macroglossia of that particular uh, habit okay then uh, when you, what what effects does macroglossia has on the individual because of the enlarged tongue the constant drooling of saliva may be present the oral cavity will be open for a long time and uh, the the individual will have a slurred speech and uh, uh, the uh, there will be widened interdental spaces between the teeth the, there are characteristic spacing between the mandibular incisors and because the tongue is exposed uh, to i mean a air for a longer period of time it ultimately shows development of fissures cracks and sometimes ulceration or secondary infection or hemorrhages are seen and owing to the enlarged tongue uh, the adenoids are also affected the adenoids may be enlarged the tonsils may be enlarged and the individual has noisy breathing and uh, he has obvious difficulties in speech chewing mastication and deglutition uh even dysphagia will be present so these are the symptoms of macroglossia okay treatment for macroglossia is to relieve the uh to relieve the symptomatic effects which the child is having by suppose in cases of down syndrome the enlarged tongue uh, it's owing to the uh, i mean uh, disturbances of oral cavity leading to glossitis leading to cracking or ulceration of the tongue in such cases just the surgical reduction or trimming is required okay so that's about the uh, macroglossia now we'll see ankyloglossia ankyloglossia the name itself indicates it's also known as a tongue tie it's a condition where what happens is normally the lingual frimula it attaches to the base of the tongue okay it attaches to about uh, one third distance from the tip of the tongue but in few cases uh, by birth by congenitally the child will have the uh, the inferior frenulum it will be attached to the tip of the tongue so this restricts the movement of the tongue so the, the such a condition is known as ankyloglossia or tongue tie basically all of the infants are about um, 1.5 to uh, to 3 percent of neonates they are born with ankyloglossia or the tongue tie condition but as the child grows the frenulum just lengthens and uh, the tongue just relieves itself and it just becomes mobile 
Suppose the frenulum is not lengthened, it is still attached to the tip of the tongue. Uh, the individual will have feeding difficulties, he will not be able to speak properly. Uh, because the movement of tongue is required for our deglutition process, the tongue will not uh, touch the tip of central incisors, the deglutition is affected. So, child will have severe nutritional deficiencies because he is not able to take his fruit properly. Uh, and characteristic speech problem will be with the letters L, R, D, T, H. So, uh, so, that, uh, so that the individual is not able to speak certain words properly. Treatment for this ankyloglossia condition is nothing but uh, frenulum is excised surgically. And uh, sometimes the complete whole of the tongue uh, is just the tip of the tongue is uh, attached to the frenulum. The frenulum is attached to the tip of the tongue. Whole of the tongue, there is no movement at all. The tongue just lies in the floor of oral cavity. In that, such a case is known as a complete ankyloglossia. Partial ankyloglossia is a condition where even though the frenulum attaches to the tip of the tongue, slightly uh, it is able to touch the tip of the central incisors. Okay. Basically, it causes restricted movement of the tongue, the ankyloglossia. Okay, uh, complete ankyloglossia, uh, there is a fusion between the tongue and the floor of the mouth. Okay, the clinical feature, clinical problems associated with uh, ankyloglossia, tongue tie as I told are uh, speech defor deformities uh, and uh, deformity in dental occlusion, uh, characteristic spacing of teeth may be seen and difficulties in swallowing as we know de deglutition process is affected. Treatment is uh, nothing but surgical excision by frenulectomy procedure. Okay, and uh, maximum of the time when it is detected in infants, it uh, it should be left like that without any treatment because uh, as the child grows, uh, the frenulum lengthens and it relieves on its own. Okay, if it is having severe uh, uh, spe severe uh, I mean speech defects and severe uh, the nutritional defects then uh, it has to go for surgical excision even in the child. So, if we can see the clinical picture of the ankyloglossia there, the frenulum it is attached to the tip of the tongue and it is just restricting the movement of the tongue and the tongue uh, it is characteristically appearing the over star shaped or oval shaped. I will see the other developmental disturbance that is the cleft tongue. We know the cleft tongue it is uh, extremely rare condition. Cleft is nothing but a division of the tongue. Okay, complete cleft tongue is very very rare condition. Partial cleft tongue uh, is seen more commonly. How the partial tongue, cleft tongue is manifested as? It is just seen as a groove on the surface of the tongue. In the midline, in the midline of dorsal surface, you just see a groove. Okay, that is a case of a partial cleft tongue. Okay, uh, why this cleft arises actually. We know anterior two thirds of the tongue is formed because of the merging of the two lateral lingual swellings. Right? If there is non-fusion of the two lateral sw uh, lingual swellings, it leads to the cleft uh, tongue appearance. Okay, And uh, partial cleft tongue arises so if there is non-fusion, uh, if the two lateral lingual uh, swellings do not fuse completely and, uh, and uh, as the uh, tongue grows, some mesoderm also develops into it and it closes the uh, cleft actually. But the, uh, in case of partial cleft tongue, the lateral lingual swellings do not merge. Even the mesoderm does not grow to obliterate the groove. Thus, clinically it is manifested as a deep groove in the midline of dorsal surface of tongue. Okay. So, you can see the clinical picture is showing a complete cleft tongue actually. The woman she has undergone uh, cosmetic uh, cosmetically uh, correction that is she wanted a bifid tongue so that's uh, the created one surgically created one but the cleft tongue appears clinically like that again uh, sometimes uh, what happens is when the partial cleft tongue occurs i told you it appears as a deep groove this groove um, uh, becomes a place for the retention of food debris for the retention of microorganisms Owing to that, it leads to irritation of the tongue erythema. And for that reasons only, you have to just keep the group surface clean. Okay. Uh, so clinical significance is nothing but entrapment of food debris uh, in that particular groove, uh, in that particular partial cleft tongue, owing to irritation. So, you have to take care to clean the groove surface also. So, the other developmental disturbance is fissured tongue. As the name indicates, appearance of fissures on the surface of tongue. 
so uh, actually the appearance of grooves and fissures on surface of tongue it's actually a normal condition actually the tongue it uh, just manifests the development of grooves and fissures which is a benign variant which is a normal anomaly seen in the tongue so numerous small grooves and um, grooves and fissures are seen on the dorsal surface of the tongue they first begin on the dorsal surface and then they tend to spread and involve the lateral surfaces or the lateral borders of the tongue so it is seen this uh, appearance of fissured tongue appearance of grooves it is seen in association with other condition other developmental condition known as geographic tongue we'll see about the geographic tongue later on so the development of this fissured tongue is actually inherited as an autosomal dominant disorder the etiology is characteristically unknown but it's just a benign variant okay uh, initially there won't be any uh, symptoms it may be asymptomatic but extreme uh, development of fissures sometimes they lead to retention of food debris retention of microorganisms leading to appearance of mild irritation or mild burning sensation on intake of foods and uh, appearance of fissured tongue is characteristically associated with mulkers and rosenthal syndrome Mulcairn's and Rosenthal syndrome is nothing but a triad of symptoms. That is, it shows the presence of fissured tongue, the seventh nerve paralysis, and the chelitis. Okay, uh, the fissured tongue basically, as I told you, it presents on the dorsal surface of tongue, and then it uh, spreads and involves the lateral borders of the tongue. So that's the appearance of a fissured tongue. You can see it is just a normal variant. Uh, about 21% of individuals uh, show the appearance of fissured tongue. It is detected on routine examination only. And uh, there is no anomaly as such. Okay, it's just a normal variant. But the fissures seem to be, or the grooves seem to be more prominent than seen on any uh, tongue normally. Okay, the median rhomboid glossitis. Median rhomboid glossitis is another developmental anomaly, developmental disturbance. It's also known by other names as central papillary atrophy of tongue, posterior lingual papillary atrophy, posterior midline atrophic candidiasis. As the name indicates, there is some atrophy of occurring on the surface of tongue. Okay, and the posterior midline atrophic candidiasis, the term indicates that the tongue it's more commonly it's prone to development of uh, candida infection or the it's an habituate of, habituate of the candidal hyphae organisms okay we'll see how so what happens is during embryo embryological development uh, the two lateral lingual swellings fuse they fuse above the uh, medium structure present there the midline structure is the tuberculum impar right so the two lateral lingual swellings they just fuse above the tuberculum impar so this uh, fusion the posterior most point of this fusion sometimes it may be defective uh, it just leaves a smooth erythematous area it is a rhomboid shaped smooth erythematous area which lacks the papillae so that's why the name central papillary atrophy or median rhomboid glossitis okay just the point of fusion of uh, lateral lingual swellings the posterior most point is just defective and lacking in papillae giving a rhomboid shaped appearance Okay, initially it is an asymptomatic condition. Uh, there are no clinical symptoms and detected on routine examination only. And it is characterized by an erythematic patch of atrophic mucosa, which is seen on the dorsal surface of tongue just beneath the circumvallate papillae. We know circumvallate papillae are situated the, between the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and posterior one-third of the tongue. Exactly at the junction, you see the circumvallate papillae. At that point only, uh, where the fusion of posterior one third and anterior two third of tongue is occurring at that point only you see this rhomboid shaped erythematous area okay basically it is a congenital abnormality as i told you it is due to failure of the fusion of lateral lingual swellings okay erythematous mucosa the rhomboid shaped area or erythematous area whatever is present it lacks the papillae hence the name central papillary atrophy the incidence of median rhomboid glossitis is about 300 to 2000 adults and it has a predilection for occurrence in males. It's just present in the posterior midline of dorsum of tongue anterior to the circumvallate papillae. Okay, uh, it, uh, the lesion, the rhomboid shaped area, it is less than 2 cm and it has a smooth flat surface because of the absence of filiform papillae. Uh, sometimes this uh, occurrence of the median rhomboid glossitis, it is associated with the midline soft palate erythema. So, association of median rhomboid glossitis with uh, soft palate erythema is given the term as kissing lesion. Okay. 
the, when you see the microscopic picture, when you study the microscopic picture, it's one of atrophic stratified squamous epithelium uh, with moderately fibrous stroma and papillae are not seen here. Okay, the, there is loss of filiform papillae and the pap capillaries appear to be dilated and the atrophic stratified squamous epithelium is characteristic. Treatment is, uh, as I told you, the posterior midline atrophic candidiasis, the term is given because this erythematous area is associated with, uh, the, I mean, it becomes a habitat for the candidal hyphae organisms. So, it's associated uh, with the development of candida, candida infection, the hypertrophic candidiasis occur. So, in, in sometimes if you just prescribe antifungal therapy, uh, the symptoms or the lesions subsides and uh, not always associated with candida. Okay, so this is the appearance of a median rhomboid glossitis, the clinical picture. If you can see the rhomboid shaped area, the red, red erythematous area in the central region, midline dorsal region, in the posterior midline region is nothing but the median rhomboid glossitis. Okay. There's other developmental disturbance that is the benign migrate leak glossitis, also known as geographic tongue, erythema migrans, or the wandering rash of tongue. The name itself indicates erythema migrans means it's a migrating rash. Okay, it's a migrating rash. The rash just moves from one place to another. That, that's why it's also known as a wandering rash of tongue. Okay, so uh, the etiology for this uh, benign migratory glossitis is a genetic etiology. It has been associated with the psoriasiform mucositis. Uh, that is, uh, it is more commonly seen in individuals with psoriasis of tongue. Okay, so when do you notice this erythema migrans or the benign migratory glossitis? Uh, symptoms of uh, association with increased levels of stress as with psoriasis. Okay, increased levels of stress predisposed to the development of this uh, benign migratory glossitis. And uh, characteristically, the individual will also have a psoriasis of skin. Uh, the lesion, uh, the benign migratory glossitis, the incidence is about 1 to 3 percent in the general population. Uh, more commonly, females are affected. It shows a female predilection. And geographic tongues are usually just seen distributed over the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Uh, it is basically characterized by serpigenous patterns of red and white erythematous area. Serpigenous are nothing but a serpentine-like, that is a snake-like uh, pattern of erythema and uh, red and white lesions. So, uh, the erythematous regions are basically the depapillated areas. That is, they are showing the loss of filiform papillae and it is surrounded by a yellow-white circinate border. There, there is a central erythema, uh, which is just surrounded by a, uh, the erythema, erythema means it is uh, la showing lack of papillae, uh, which is surrounded by a yellow or white circinate border. And uh, this is uh, the appearance of this uh, form of erythema and uh, bordering is seen only on the dorsal surface of the tongue. And uh, at one point of time, if you see the uh, characteristic patch is present on the tip of the tongue after a few days or one week maybe you will see that the patch has just moved on and migrated to the middle midline of the tongue so that's that's why the term uh, uh, wandering rash of tongue is given or erythema migrans is given to this condition and uh, sometimes the distribution of patches on dorsal surface it just appears to give the uh, appearance of a, a continental outline of the globe so that's why the term geographic tongue is given because the outline just resembles the geographic outline of the world. So this is the benign migratory glossitis. You can see red and white uh, mixed patches will be present. Erythematous area with the normal appearing mucosa will be just alternating with each other. Actually no particular treatment for this uh, condition geographic tongue is uh, prescribed. But sometimes uh, topical prednisolone just gives us rapid relief of the symptoms. And when you see the microscopic picture of uh, geographic tongue, it's one of a psoriasis. So you can see inflammatory cells with characteristic Monroe's abscesses. Rated edges will be thin and elongated. And the epithelial surface, it shows a thickened layer of keratin. Okay, the characteristic of psoriasis, that is the inflammatory cells, Monroe's abscess will be present even in cases of geographic tongue. So now we'll see other developmental disturbance, that is a hairy tongue. Actually, hairy tongue, it is uh, arising because of defective desquamation of the filiform papillae. Normally, the uh, filiform papillae will be just 
situated in the midline of the tongue. Okay, it will be just scattered. If suppose the filiform papillae are uh, become elongated, they tend to trap the debris uh, on the surface. Owing to that, bacterial and fungal growth occurs. That leads to accumulation of all the products and uh, pigmentation or color appears, giving the characteristic color to the tongue, either brown, green, or black. Okay, so that's the concept behind the hairy tongue. Hairy tongue, it's also known as lingua nigra, lingua villosa, or the black hairy tongue. Uh, it's not necessary that the hairy tongue should be black in color. It may be either brown, green or pink owing to the deposits occurring on the surface of tongue. Uh, basically, it's a defective desquamation of papillae. There is the filiform papillae will be enlarged here. And uh, there is marked uh, accumulation of keratin on the surface of this uh, filiform papillae. What is the etiology for the development of hairy tongue? Either a lack of mechanical stimulation. Suppose the individual is uh, not eating a rough diet. He is taking a very, very soft diet. He is not brushing his uh, tongue or teeth properly. The, uh, the individual who is chronically ill or debilitated, who is bedridden, they show more prone to develop this. And even the penicillin uh, antibiotic therapy, if the individual is on penicillin antibiotic therapy for a prolonged period, then also he is more prone to develop this. Poor oral hygiene is characteristic for development of this and uh, even in cases of extensive x-ray radiation uh, you see the development of uh, this lingual uh, lingua nigra villosa. Okay, so the clinical appearance of uh, black hairy tongue is one of uh, 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 thick pigment like region occurring in the posterior region of the tongue with greater accentuity towards the posterior region okay uh, the thick pigment like deposition is seen in the midline uh, which is just accentuated or becomes more prominent as one goes towards the posterior one third of the tongue and uh, the lingua nigra is seen in greater frequency uh, in males usually in cases of hiv infected individuals they are more immunocompromised and more prone to develop uh, th uh, this uh, hairy tongue and uh, you have to differentiate hairy tongue with other uh, forms like the oral hairy leukoplakia and uh, when you study the histologic examination, you'll see that oral hairy leukoplakia, it's associated with Epstein-Barr virus, whereas hairy tongue is not associated with Epstein-Barr virus. And normally the filiform papillae will be just 1 mm in length here because of uh, the defective desquamation, because of lack of mechanical stimulation or brushing, the filiform papillae are enlarged to the extent of 15 mm in length. And as I told you, the tongue has a thick coating in the middle, the pigment deposition is seen in the middle and it becomes more accentuated towards the back of the tongue. And uh, that pigment or the last filiform papillae, they tend to entrap the debris so that uh, microorganisms accumulate, bacterial and fungal growth occurs. And candidal hyphae organisms are more prone to just become habituated in that filiform papillae and leading to uh, candidal uh, leukoplakia or the hairy leukoplakia. And um, the tongue may, uh, the candida overgrowth may cause extreme glossoptosis. So the clinically, the individual presents to you with the symptoms of uh, tickling sensation in the oropharynx region and inability to take the food, dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing uh, and uh, burning tongue, uh, symptoms of burning tongue. So here you can see the clinical picture. It has a greatish keratin deposition on the dorsal surface of tongue. So the clinical picture may be misleading because as I told you it may be uh, in similarity to the oral hairy leukoplakia or the candidal leukoplakia. You, so you have to just carry out the histologic examination to rule out other uh, diseases. So the microscopic picture of the hairy tongue is one of enlarged filiform papillae with the hyperkeratosis of epithelium and presence of occasional inflammatory cells. Treatment is nothing but the etiology is the lack of mechanical stimulation. So once the tongue brushing and the mechanical stimulation of oral cavity is done by use of a tongue scraper, it automatically leads in regression of the filiform papillae. Suppose the filiform papillae are not regressed even after mechanical stimulation at all. Uh, you have to carry out procedures like electro desiccation or carbon dioxide laser where the enlarged filiform papillae are just excised or removed surgically. And uh, suppose the individual is on prolonged antibiotic therapy, you have to just reduce the dosage or completely uh, reduce, remove the antibiotic dosage to the patient. Then uh, the other common developmental disturbance is the lingual varix. What is a varix? Varix is a tortuous vein situated. Uh, basically, the, we see there are a lot of veins in the uh, ventral surface of the tongue, that is in the floor of the mouth. So you see a lot of veins are present. Suppose uh, one vein it is just dilated because 
uh, it becomes tortuous because it is subjected to increased hydrostatic pressure and it is not supported by the surrounding tissue okay muscular tissue whatever are present they don't support the vein we, we can see a lot of lingual renine veins uh, which are just uh, sometimes they just become tortuous owing to development of this uh, lingual varices they clinically they appear as red or purple short like clusters seen in the ventral surface of the tongue usually they involve the lingual renine veins you know lingual uh, the uh, the lingual varices they represent an aging process because the varix is mostly seen after the age of 50 years so the appearance or presence of varix has been indicated or associated with premature aging process okay there is no specific treatment for the lingual uh, renine veins or the varix vein as such okay uh, then the lingual thyroid nodule it is also a developmental anomaly it is basically characterized by appearance of uh, thyroid tissue in the substance of the tongue it is an anomalous condition in which the follicles of thyroid gland may be found in the substance of tongue so as we have seen the embryologic development of uh, tongue uh, both the tongue and the thyroid gland develop at the same time and there like, appears to be a connection between the tongue and the thyroid gland that is nothing but the thyroglossal tract the remnant of these thyroglossal tract it is a uh, seen as foramen cecum between the posterior uh, one third and anterior two thirds of the tongue right sometimes what happens is few of the tissue of the thyroid uh, gland it just remains in the substance of tongue leading to development of this lingual thyroid nodule uh, clinically it appears as a nodule or a mass on the base of the tongue substance of the tongue in the midline of the tongue it appears to be a deeply seated nodule okay uh, the etiology the etiology is nothing but enlargement of lingual thyroid nodule or sometimes uh, the chief thyroid gland if it is not functioning properly the the, the tissue of uh, thyroid gland which is present in the substance of tongue it is an accessory thyroid gland so the chief thyroid gland is not functioning properly so the accessory thyroid gland takes up the tissue of thyroid gland and it just becomes hyperfunctional it becomes nodular okay which we can see in the oral cavity and sometimes the primitive thyroid gland it doesn't descend from the base of the tongue to its position near the hyoid bone so it remains in the base of the tongue only and it will be the only thyroid gland present for that individual okay so owing to the nodular mass seen in the oral cavity so when you see a nodular mass you have to just rule out the presence of a normal uh, thyroid gland okay the presence of a nodular mass in oral cavity is invariably ectopic thyroid but you have to rule out the presence of a normal thyroid gland first. Clinically, it just appears as a nodular mass. It appears to be deeply situated and uh, it will be just about 1 to 2 centimeter in diameter. 2 to 3 centimeters. And uh, as with thyroid gland, the symptoms may be dysphagia, dyspnea, dysphonia or fullness of the throat. Because the nodular mass is present in the posterior uh, third of the tongue or base of the tongue, uh, it obstructs the intake of food it obstructs our sleep it obstructs our breathing also okay and the individual will have a tightness or fullness in the throat so whenever you see such a you you are suspecting a nodular mass to be ectopic thyroid you have to just uh, take out a radiograph or a CT scan um, uh, you have to just palpate the normal thyroid gland if the normal thyroid gland is not palpated you have to just send it for radioisotope scanning then then also if the thyroid gland is not detected you have to just make sure that uh, this is the only thyroid gland present. So if you uh, if you remove this ectopic thyroid gland, the individual uh, will have uh, hypothyroidism. So thyroid replacement therapy has to be carried out if this ectopic thyroid gland is being excised. Okay. And histologically, when you extend the nodular mass for histologic examination, you see that follicles of thyroid tissue may be present in the uh, base of the tongue. And sometimes the nodules exhibit the colloid degeneration as we see in the thyroid gland tissue. And treatment is nothing but a surgical excision. As I told you, you have to just rule out the presence of other thyroid gland in other uh, regions of uh, neck. If it is not present, this is the only thyroid gland and uh, when excising, the individual has to be put on a thyroid hormone replacement therapy.